Section 10 of The New Life, La Vita Nuova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The New Life, La Vita Nuova by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Section 10. On that day which fulfilled the year since my lady had been made of the citizens of eternal life, remembering me of her as I sat alone, I betook myself to draw the resemblance of an angel upon certain tablets. And while I did thus, chancing to turn my head, I perceived that some were standing beside me, to whom I should have given courteous welcome, and that they were observing what I did. Also I learned afterward that they had been there a while before I perceived them, perceiving whom I arose for salutation, and said, Another was with me. Afterwards, when they had left me, I set myself again to mine occupation, to wit, to the drawing figures of angels, in doing which I conceived to write of this matter in rhyme, as for her anniversary, and to address my rhymes unto those who had just left me. It was then that I wrote the sonnet which saith, That Lady. And as this sonnet hath two commencements, it behoveth me to divide it with both of them here. I say that, according to the first, this sonnet has three parts. In the first I say that this lady was then in my memory. In the second, I tell what love, therefore, did with me. In the third, I speak of the effects of love. The second begins here, love knowing. The third here, fourth they went. This part divides into two. In the one, I say that all my sighs issued speaking. In the other, I say how some spoke certain words different from the others. The second begins here, and still. In this same manner is it divided with the other beginnings, save that, in the first part, I tell when this lady had thus come into my mind. In this I say not in the other. That lady of all gentle memories had lighted on my soul, whose new abode lies now, as it was well ordained of God, among the poor in heart where Mary is. Love, knowing that dear image to be his, woke up within the sick heart sorrow bowed, unto the sighs which are its weary load, saying, Go forth. And they went forth, I whiz, Forth went they from my breast that throbbed and ached, with such a pang as oftentimes will bathe mine eyes with tears when I am left alone. And still those sighs which drew the heaviest breath came whispering thus, O noble intellect, it is a year to-day that thou art gone. Second Commencement That lady of all gentle memories had lighted on my soul, for whose sake flowed the tears of love, in whom the power abode, which led you to observe while I did this, love, knowing that dear image to be his, etc. Then, having sat for some space sorely in thought, because of the time that was now past, I was so filled with dolorous imaginings that it became outwardly manifest in mine altered countenance. Whereupon, feeling this and being in dread lest any should have seen me, I lifted mine eyes to look, and then perceived a young and very beautiful lady, who was gazing upon me from a window with a gaze full of pity, so that the very sum of pity appeared gathered together in her and seeing that unhappy persons, when they beget compassion in others, are then most moved unto weeping, as though they also felt pity for themselves, it came to pass that mine eyes began to be inclined unto tears. Wherefore, becoming fearful lest I should make manifest mine abject condition, I rose up and went where I could not be seen of that lady, saying afterwards within myself, Certainly with her also must abide most noble love. And with that I resolved upon writing a sonnet, wherein, speaking unto her, I should say all that I have just said and as this sonnet is very evident, I will not divide it. Mine eyes beheld the blessed pity spring into thy countenance immediately, a while gone when thou beheldest in me the sickness only hidden grief can bring. And then I knew thou wast considering how abject and forlorn my life must be, and I became afraid that thou shouldst see my weeping and account it a base thing. Therefore I went out from thee, feeling how the tears were straightway loosened at my heart, beneath thine eyes compassionate control, and afterwards I said within my soul, Lo, with this lady dwells the counterpart of the same love who holds me weeping now. It happened after this that whensoever I was seen of this lady she became pale and of a piteous countenance, as though it had been with love, whereby she remembered me many times of my own most noble lady, who was wont to be of a like paleness. And I know that often, when I could not weep nor in any way give ease unto mine anguish, I went to look upon this lady, who seemed to bring the tears into my eyes by the mere sight of her, of the which thing I bethought me to speak unto her in rhyme, and then made this sonnet, which begins Love's Pallor, and which is plain without being divided, by its exposition aforesaid. Love's power in the semblance of deep ruth, 
or never yet shone forth so perfectly in any lady's face chancing to see grief's miserable countenance uncouth as in thine lady they have sprung to soothe when in mine anguish thou hast looked on me until sometimes it seems as if through thee my heart might almost wander from its truth yet so it is i cannot hold mine eyes from gazing very often upon thine in the sore hope to shed those tears they keep and at such time thou makest the pent tears rise even to the brim till the eyes waste and pine yet cannot they while thou art present weep at length by the constant sight of this lady mine eyes began to be gladdened over much with her company through which thing many times i had much unrest and rebuked myself as a base person also many times i cursed the unsteadfastness of mine eyes and said to them inwardly was not your grievous condition of weeping want one while to make others weep and will ye now forget this thing because a lady looketh upon you who so looketh merely in compassion of the grief ye then showed for your own blessed lady but what so ye can that do ye accursed eyes many a time i will make you remember it for never till death dry you up should ye make an end of your weeping and when i had spoken thus unto mine eyes i was taken again with extreme and grievous sighing and to the end that this inward strife which i had undergone might not be hidden from all saving the miserable wretch who endured it i proposed to write a sonnet and to comprehend in it this horrible condition and i wrote this which begins the very bitter weeping the sonnet has two parts in the first i speak to my eyes as my heart spoke within myself in the second i remove a difficulty showing who it is that speaks thus and this part begins here so far it well might receive other divisions also but this would be useless since it is manifest by the preceding exposition the very bitter weeping that ye made so long a time together eyes of mine was wont to make the tears of pity shine in other eyes full oft as i have said but now this thing were scarce remembered if i on my part foully would combine with you and not recall each ancient sign of grief and her for whom your tears were shed it is your fickleness that doth betray my mind to fears and makes me tremble thus what while a lady greets me with her eyes except by death we must not any way forget our lady who is gone from us so far doth my heart utter and then sighs the sight of this lady brought me into so unwonted a condition that i often thought of her as a one too dear unto me and i began to consider her thus this lady is young beautiful gentle and wise perchance it was love himself who set her in my path that so my life might find peace and there were times when i thought yet more fondly until my heart consented unto its reasoning but when it had so consented my thought would often turn round upon me as moved by reason and cause me to say within myself what hope is this which would console me after so base a fashion and which hath taken the place of all other imagining also there was another voice within me that said and wilt thou having suffered so much tribulation through love not escape while yet thou mayest from so much bitterness thou must surely know that this thought carries with it the desire of love and drew its life from the gentle eyes of that lady who vouchsafed thee so much pity wherefore i having striven sorely and very often with myself bethought me to say somewhat thereof in rhyme and seeing that in the battle of doubts the victory most often remained with such as inclined towards the lady of whom i speak it seemed to me that i should address this sonnet unto her in the first line whereof i call that thought which spake of her a gentle thought only because it spoke of one who was gentle being of itself most vile in this sonnet i make myself into two according as my thoughts were divided one from the other the one part i call heart that is appetite the other soul that is reason and i tell what one saith to the other in that it is fitting to call the appetite heart and the reason soul is manifest enough to them to whom i wish this to be open true it is that in the preceding sonnet i take the part of heart against the eyes and that appears contrary to what i say in the present and therefore i say that there also by the heart i mean appetites because yet greater was my desire to remember my most gentle lady than to see this other although indeed i had some appetites towards her but it appeared slight wherefrom it appears that the one statement is not contrary to the other this sonnet has three parts in the first i begin to say to this lady how my desires turn all towards her in the second i say how the soul that is the reason speaks to the heart that is to the appetite in the third i say how the latter answers the second begins here and what is this the third here and the heart answers a gentle thought there is will often start within my secret self to speech of thee also of love it speaks so tenderly that much in me consents and takes its part
And what is this, the soul saith to the heart, that cometh thus to comfort thee and me, and thence where it would dwell, thus potently, can drive all other thoughts by its strange art? And the heart answers, Be no more at strife, twixt doubt and doubt, this is love's messenger, and speaketh but his words, from him received. And all the strength it owns, and all the life, it draweth from the gentle eyes of her, who, looking on our grief, hath often grieved. End of section 10